This session is from user personas to testing a project manager's journey towards BHAT. My name is Michelle Lauer. I'm a technical project manager at BioRaft. I've been a Drupal developer uh, since the Drupal 5 days. I didn't do the math on what year it was. Um, I also organized the, the Manchester, New Hampshire Drupal meetup, contributing author to the definitive guide to Drupal 7, and I organized something called Drupal Nights uh, along with BioRaft. If you go to drupalnights.org, you have all of our uh, sessions that we record once a month, and it's all free for you, just extra learning stuff. Um, so BioRaft, the, the platform is a scientific research management system and provides an integrated portal for compliance, safety, oversight, training, inspections. Um, it's essentially, it's a Drupal site. It's software as a service. It's a multi-site application. Uh, and we are hiring, looking for talented Drupal devs. So uh, those are the postcards that I'm passing out. We need you to help prevent the next zombie apocalypse. Because, you know, you just mix two chemicals wrong and that you get a zombie attack. So we'd love for you guys to come find us. There's a couple of us around here. So my journey started, uh, I started at Byraf about a year ago. And anytime you start a new company, you're inheriting, you know, some stuff. So I was inheriting existing technical debt. Um, we were inadvertently creating new bugs on top of that. And although we were going through and doing manual QA for, for during every release, I mean, it was time consuming. And I, I didn't feel like we were getting ahead. We kind of had plateaued. I'm going to tell you about how I came to our solution, which is about user personas, user journeys, user stories, and finally, automated acceptance testing. Existing technical debt are things you could fix now, but you don't, and you pay for it later. And that's what we are experiencing now. Our application is you know, 10 years old. Of course, we've upgraded and things, but we are inheriting a lot of stuff over time. There was a lot of business pressure in the early days to release quickly. And so we cut some corners. We said, oh, we'll get back. We'll, we'll refactor that later. And, and we didn't. And that caused some issues now. Um, our components are not nearly as loosely coupled as we would like. And the documentation um, just inside the code isn't as good as we'd like. So that's our technical debt. It kind of keeps me up at night, actually. Uh, what I've decided to do is accept the decisions that were made in the past. That's great. It got us to where we are. And I'm really happy where we are as a company and as, as an application. And so we just need to address new things. So we need to very slowly start refactoring. When we have a, a, a task that is working with some older code, we refactor it then. We don't start from the beginning and refactor everything. Um, but we're making the decision to not create any new technical debt. All new code is written so it's more loosely coupled, so we can piece together the building blocks together. The other issue I was mentioning is that, you know, new bugs. Every release, we release code, and the next day, we're patching that release because we, we missed something. And one of our clients will call us up and say, did you guys mean to do that? And we'll say, oh, sorry, no, we didn't. Let me go fix that real quick. And, you know, one tiny change that you think you're, you're addressing one section of the site can have ripple effects in other sections of the site. And it's challenging. If you catch it too late, you know, that's when you, you get the client calling you. Uh, we're really good about peer code reviews. Every line of code is looked at by another developer or myself before it goes out. So we're trying really, really hard to mitigate this. We even do this whole manual QA process. Every single ticket that goes out, uh, we check. Did it meet the spec? Did you actually do what you were supposed to do? And then did it break anything else? So we go through and check that. We also have what I call the big testing ticket. And we go through every single vertical of the site. Or we would go through and say, okay, someone who's got blog section, great. And they go through and basically try to click everything. Our email sending, our statuses being changed, is the workflow moving around as expected. And it is extremely time consuming. It's repetitious doing this every single month. On top of it, it's inconsistent. Well, what if I log into the blog section as a, a moderator versus a reader? Well, I'm going to have a different experience. And are, is our testing capturing that? While I'm thinking about all these things that are challenging me, that I'm sure challenge every and everyone who's got an application, uh, I was doing some continuing education. I attended a one-day course um, for Agile and Scrum fundamentals. I'm sure lots of you have taken a course similar to that. Uh, remember, I'm a developer. I've worked on Agile teams, but I've never tried to organize an Agile team. So I'm trying to learn as much that I can. I did a webinar from Atlassian 
and where they talked about user personas and user journeys, and that was, was wonderful. And even at our own Drupal Nights, I learned something. One of my colleagues presented on BHAT, and he did a very technical uh, description of it, how do you get it started, and all of a sudden, I just had this light bulb moment. I'm like, I'm gonna solve all my problems. We already have a culture of quality at my company. We do code reviews, we do manual QA testing, now, and we also even have these automatic data validity tests that run every night on cron to make sure the data is the right type that we expect and things like that. But we need to start thinking about this from a new, new perspective. I need, I need some new goals. I want to focus more on the business value. What parts of the site are actually most important to our application? And I also want to think about who we're testing as. You can't do everything as admin. You get a different experience. You guys all know that. And I also want to have uh, consistent test coverage and repeatable test coverage. So the solution that I came up with is let's start with figuring out who those roles are. We have a handful of, you know, kind of characters on our site, uh, even Drupal roles and permissions and personalities and things. So I'm gonna to try to bring those together and create personas. I'm gonna take that persona and walk them through a journey on the site, let them achieve a single task or goal, and I'm gonna break that down into user stories. And I'm gonna note which tasks potentially um, are, are the most important with business value, and um, with that too, I can start thinking about code coverage here uh, as far as importance. And the last thing is pulling all of that together, it will be able to start thinking about automated acceptance tests. User personas. These are fictitious characters that represent each different type of person that visits your site. What you're trying to create here, um, you're trying to describe the tendencies of the user, not, um, not the tendencies of the user, but more of their behaviors. How do they interact on your site? What are they thinking? What are they feeling? So when you start creating these, you first need to define your segments. Are there people on your sites that are paid members? Do you have people that are only email subscribers? Um, what about people that you know, just donate money regu regularly? Is it important if someone's a man or a woman? Does it matter if they have children or not? All these th things in their, um, that you're starting to describe helps you figure out who this persona is. Another thing is to start articulating any values and beliefs they might have. Maybe political persuasion. Maybe certain hobbies are important and also start figuring out some personality char characteristics. There's some people when things don't go right, they throw their arms up in the air, oh my God, it's broken. Well, that's a personality characteristic that you need to work with in your site. Whereas you've got other people when something doesn't go right, they're more persevering and trying to find a solution on their own. You need to get into their skin. What's their self-image? Any day-to-day -day worries or habits that you should be noting at all? And also an important thing is what value do they get from your organization? Why do they come to your site and share an article on Facebook? Why do they donate money? What makes them actually leave a comment on a post? And lastly, you can start thinking about a little bit more Drupal-y here is what roles and permissions do they have on your site? Are they anonymous users? Are they paid members? Are they some sort of super user or moderator? Another important thing to note is what tasks do they commonly uh, complete on your website? Are they uploading photos? Are they rating content uh, in BioRaft? Are they scheduling inspections? Every site's unique, so this is something very specific to your application. And the very last thing, and I think the most important thing, give them a face, give them a name, make them human. <coughs> I told you I was watching a, a webinar from Atlassian, and, this is a screenshot of that. They've got Emma the Eager, and she's got a tagline that says, I want to learn as much as I can as quickly as possible. If you guys end up watching this webinar, uh, there's a little saying where they actually have all of these personas taped around the office everywhere, and they have a screenshot of the men's bathroom with it up there. So it's, it's in their head at all times. All people in the company are now thinking like their users. Every decision they make is like their users. Further down on the card, they're listing some of those other things I was talking about. Skills, in this case, <coughs> software and languages. So for Atlassian, you know, Jira and Confluence, that's an important thing to capture. For your website, probably not something important, but there's something akin to that that you guys can put on there. 
So we started creating our own. This is Roger O'Neill. Roger O'Neill is Environmental Health and Safety Director. He's the department head. Um, he works you know, in the oversight group. And his tagline, I want to be a resource to the researchers, not the safety police. So we go through and we start outlining, well, tell me about Roger. You know, uh, how does he react to problems? What's his role in BioRaft? Um, what are some of the tasks that he does? And we start rating different pieces. So like I said, his tagline um, is printed there. I find that really important because that's the one sentence that helps you understand who this user is. So now that they've got a face, a name, and a tagline. Their, uh, their job position, that may or may not be relevant on your site, but for us it's actually very relevant because the people who use BioRaft are institutions and we kind of need to know their hierarchy. Are they a lab member, a lab manager, or are they you know, an oversight group? Also important, those characteristic traits uh, and traits. I was talking about you know, someone who's really intelligent and you know, an, an overachiever. They interact with your site very, very differently than someone who's a little intimidated by it. Um, I'm thinking of all the times you know, I'm helping someone um, like my mother like, go through Facebook. Like, she's really scared she's going to post something that she doesn't mean to. Her photos are just all going to upload. And, and that's a very different kind of person than someone who is not scared of technology. So the role in BioRaft, um, like I said, this is specific to our application, but it's a paragraph that describes some of the duties he does. He oversees things. He delegates. And what are some of those things that he does? Well, it's a task list here. He views dashboards. He views inspection logs. He even schedules inspections, which we'll talk a little bit about later. And starting to take your persona and outline what are their common activities is really important. You can even go as far as to include um, some Drupal permissions and roles. You know, some sites have an administrator, a content admin, and just an authenticated user. If that's the case, well, you may not, you can exclude this section. We have hundreds of permissions and roles um, grouped together in a, a new way in our application that we call job activities. And these are some of the things that he does. He needs to be able to uh, view institutional biological information. He also needs to be able to view the group biological information, which is a little bit more specific. So he's got extra, extra power in, in his world. This is my favorite. We actually uh, hired this girl to help us over the summer. She's getting her master's degree in usability studies, and she was helping me put all these together. And she came up with this graph here. I think the visual is very, very powerful about, you know, technophobe, technophile. Where does Roger on that scale? So he, he's a little bit scared of technology, but you know what? He is an expert at BioRaft, which I think is really, really often. And the other important thing is, well, how often is, is Roger on the site? You know, some of our... Um, our users are just the, the researchers. And when they get an email, they come take their training, and then they don't think about BioRaft for three months. And so they're not on the site that frequently. But Roger, he's on the site every single day doing a different activity. So you put it all back together. Again, we've got our user persona. Next up is the user journey. This is the journey that our persona is going to travel on. User journey um, displays a user flow, and it really helps you prioritize you know, feature enhancements because we're going we're gonna to start with that persona, and then we're going to take a goal on the website, one of his common tasks, and we're going to plot all the actions that person does in order to complete that task. The other interesting thing is marking whether these tasks are, are frustrating to the user, or if they're challenging or difficult, how they feel. Another screenshot from the Atlassian webinar, and they have a really, really complicated journey here. But you can see, even though it's blurry top left, they've got their picture of the, their persona, they've got some information about them, they've got the journey, and then in the bottom underneath it, it's kind of their, their level of engagement for this activity. So we've got Roger again. Um, his journey here is to ensure a lab will be inspected at a specific date. And this is a very high-level journey. I mean, there's really only four steps. We're, we're entering the system. We're logging in. We're determining what's the lab name, the date that it should be inspected, and who the inspector should be. We add it and then confirm that we did that. We've got a nice little graph here, and we've got smiley faces and frowny faces, so we know how frustrating the task is for that user. 
So we've identified from this, this high level one that determining the lab date inspector is slightly frustrating. So let's dive in a little bit deeper. Well, what are the steps actually in, involved in that? There's actually a couple ways that you can do that in many sites. You know, there's, there's five different paths to reach your goal. So one of those here is clicking on the, the inspections in the accordion menu and finding the inspection queue, seeing what all the scheduled inspections are and determining if the lab he wanted to inspect is already scheduled or not. So that, yeah, not too bad. So that's not where the problem is. But there's another way he could get there too. Instead of going into inspections, he can go into all, uh, the all laboratory listing, um, finding the lab he wants to inspect, then landing on the dashboard, and then um, scrolling to the bottom to see if it's queued up already. And that's where we've identified that um, finding the lab to be inspected is actually the pain point. So since we've identified that, that means, well, maybe we should dedicate some resources next sprint to, to figuring that out more and, and solving, solving that problem. When you're putting together your, your user journeys, you can separate these steps into certain kinds of categories to help you to organize it in your head better. Um, if you go online and look at pictures, a lot of people actually print these categories in their journeys. But the first thing is like discovery and pre-engagement. That could be as simple as logging in. You know, you've got to log in before you can do anything else. Then there's the investigation or the preparation phase. Um, where you are navigating to the correct pages that you need to to figure out what your uh, your task is going to be, your action, you know, clicking submit, uh, perhaps, uh, to get you to another page, and at the very end, the confirmation that your task is complete. So that's one way to think about each of your journeys. As you saw, our, the journey that we were talking about was very, very simple. It was very singular. It's truly scheduling an inspection. It's not even doing an inspection. It's literally just putting it on the calendar. So it's very important that you break these down into very, very small journeys so you can identify these pain points. What I like to do is just have a range of five, you know, happy, neutral, sad. You don't need to get complicated. Um, there shouldn't be an algorithm for this. It's just red, yellow, green. Now, the big question is, is, well, how do we know what these pain points are? Well, depending on your site, pay attention to support requests. I mean, we've got clients calling us and emailing us, asking us questions like, oh, how do I do that? Or I'm a little stuck here. This didn't work as I expected. Can you explain it better? Well. If we're getting a lot of calls in the same area, clearly that's a pain point for whatever reason. Either they require user training or we need to tra uh, change our application, depending on the scenario. The other thing you can do is interview real users. The previous session was talking about that. Um, well, how do you find these real users? Um, one of the questions like, well, I've got a site for a college. Well, just walk out into the, you know, the common yard and start asking people. Great way to interview people. But don't forget that your teammates are real users too. If you've got a sales team and they're giving demos, trust me, that salesperson knows what the pain points are. They do this every single day. They know what they trip up on. They know what areas they avoid in the demonstration because it doesn't work quite right. So interview real people. So we've got our persona, Roger. Roger takes a journey to schedule an inspection. We can break that down even further into user stories. A user story is a description of a feature from the perspective of the person who's going to be using it, which is clearly in our case, it's going to be Roger. Uh, the value comes from, from putting the user experience first in, in all of these situations, and it really helps you understand why. Why did we build this feature? I, mean, I could very clearly put you know, a, a card in my sprint that says we really need a picture of a pony in the bottom right corner. But if someone says why and it asks me to write a user story, I'm not going to be able to deliver that. So you should reevaluate how important that is. But if you can answer why and there's business value in there, then it's worth developing that feature. User stories follow the format as type of user, I want some goal, so that some reason. You guys have all seen that before, I'm sure. As an environmental health and safety director, I want to check the inspection schedule for tomorrow so I know what to expect. Clearly follows that pattern. As the EHS director, I want to schedule an inspection so that the inspectors know what their tasks are. As an EHS director, I want to schedule an inspection so that the lab managers are prepared for the inspections. See what I did there? Top two are the same, but the why is different. There's actually two reasons why you might want to do a task. 
Those, by the way, potentially have two separate journeys, too, because you might be able to do a journey for this lab member who checks their email to see if they have notification that an inspection was just scheduled or a reminder saying, hey, it's this morning. You might want to take all food out of the lab. Um, so you need to really think about um, the reason why. And different people, different users in your system will have different reasons why. More common examples that you might be familiar with. As a member, I want to upload photos so that I can share photos with others. As an administrator, I want to approve photos before they are posted so that I can make sure that they're appropriate. <clears throat> One thing I want to make sure you guys realize as we use our stories is this is the fodder to actually creating a ticket in you know, Trello or Jira to give to your developers. You take these user stories and you make your balsamic mock-ups and you make sure they fit. So the developer is going through at the very end and and did he accomplish his goal? Like, can a regular member upload photos? Yes, that works. Well, it's not very specific. Your mock-up will have some more information, or maybe you need some sub-stories uh, or elaborate more. Um, I want to make sure, not that I can upload photos necessarily, but I want to make sure when I go to my profile, I can upload a new profile photo. That leads us into behavior-driven development. We actually just spent a lot of time talking about behaviors. and. Now we can use that to begin our, our, our journey into testing our own application. So BDD is a specialized version of test-driven development, which focuses on behavior specifications. It's not if I pass an array to a function that's expecting a string and my test fails. This is really about what is the user expecting the one unique thing about BDD, or test-driven development, is that you write the test first. There are so many projects where you try saying to the client, you know, oh, we're almost done, we just have to write the tests. And they're like, oh, no, no, we don't have that in the budget. And those tests never get written. Well, what if you write the test first? Then it's always in the budget, because they're going to want that feature. So you define a test set for the unit first. You implement the unit. You, you code. Um, and then you verify that the implementation of the unit test actually succeeds. Behavior-driven development is for business analysts, so project managers, product managers, and developers. It's a joint effort. They need to collaborate, and they take those user stories, and they're going to transform them actually into test cases. There is an absolute direct correlation between every user story you've written and the behavioral driven development style test that will be written. It's just one next step you guys have to take. User story. We just saw this. As a member, I want to upload photos so that I can share photos with others. Follows a pattern. A BDD scenario. Given that I'm logged in as a member, when I'm on my profile page, I should see a link to upload photos. Again, follows another pattern. They're very, very similar, so once you've got the user stories, translating those into tests is just one extra step. When pulling all these together um, with behavior-driven development, you have a file for each feature. So you've got a search feature, a photos feature, a blog feature. What is that section of your site that you are testing? You can get as granular as you want here. This is purely organizational. And in each of those files, you're going to list your scenarios. And my favorite part, you get to tag them too, just like you tag content so you can find it better. So if I've got the, um, an events scenario, I can have one for browsing, one for adding events, and you can just add tags to it. The other thing that's really, really good is that you can tag something as test. So when you are literally working on something at that moment, you can say, only run these five, and I only want to run things that are tagged with test. So you don't have to go through your whole suite. Over time, your suite's going to get pretty big. You know, it could take a while to run. And that's wonderful, but you don't want to do that every time you add a semicolon. So you can specify that. That brings us to BHAT. BHAT's just a flavor of, of behavioral-driven development. There's actually a lot of them out there. But Drupal has adopted BHAT as its favorite. You've probably heard of Selenium. That's another one, too. So it's just a tool. Um, helps you write human readable stories. That's the key here. These stories are not in some jargon that you need a PhD to understand. It's in English, 
So, and it follows a pattern, too, that is very, very easy to read. I talked about those files. So here's an example of a feature file. This would be the events.feature. At the very top of the file, you say what it is, and then you kind of describe it a little bit. In order to find events as a website user, I need to be able to see them displayed. Well, that's the motivation of everything in this file. And the way this file will get um, interpreted is after feature, it expects three lines, and it will not execute those three lines until we get down actually into the individual scenarios. You can use hashtags for comments, and you can see I've added one here. It's purely de demonstration purposes. They're not really necessary. So for each scenario, first thing I'm doing is I'm tagging it. That's what the at sign is. I'm tagging this one as Drupal Nights. And I'm tagging this one as events. You could say, perhaps, you're testing some things that are more Drupal core related, like a user logging in. That's kind of independent of your site in many cases. That's what Drupal does. So you could tag something as core versus you know, my site, which is Drupal Nights. We've got our scenario. Um, this is expected syntax as well. The interpreter is, will expect to see a description of what each of these tests is. And so the scenario is, see the next Drupal Nights event. So given that I'm on slash, well, that's the front page, then I should see the upcoming Drupal Nights block in sidebar A region. That's easy. You guys can write that, right? So we've got a couple things in quotes here. These are actually variables. So that our code in the back end can be reused, you can pass in variables. Sometimes you're going to be in sidebar A. Sometimes you're going to be in sidebar B. So you just pass that in inside the quotes. Same is true for upcoming Drupal Nights. That's the H2, the block title. Another example, this would be the contact dot feature for my site. In order to submit feedback as a website user, I need to be able to fill out a contact form. So we tag this as Drupal Nights and contact. I've got a scenario. Do not submit form when required fields are not filled out. So as I go through, I have filled out every single field explicitly. When I get to the line that says, and I fill in message with empty quotes, that means I didn't fill it out, I essentially skipped over it. I hit submit, and I should see message field is required. So that then I should see, it's just reading the text on the page. And if it, if it shows up, it's there, and then it passes that test. This one's a little bit different. It's another way you can test the contact form. Um, this is showing how if filling out the entire form, um, you get success sent. I was actually, funny story. So I'm playing with this, you know, up in the lounge beforehand and making sure I, my screenshots for my code were all correct. And then I take a break and I look at my phone. I'm like, who's sending me all these messages? <laughs> well, it actually submits the form. So keep that in mind. Make sure you reroute emails on when you're, you're testing. So this one, um, I should see, uh, your message has been sent. And clearly it works because I got the email. So all that human readable code we were just looking at is very, very easy. But this is where it becomes a collaboration between product and project managers and the development team. There needs to be a back end that interprets all of that English. And it's your file, your feature context.php file. Here we've got uh, a function that, if you can see the title, it says, I fill each field of form with random text. So I don't know if you guys just saw, when I was filling out the form, I explicitly filled out every single field. That might be the best test for your website, but you also might want to say, when I hit this form, just fill it out with random stuff. I don't really care what's there. It could be any string, um, and then we'll work with that. So that's another reason for the collaboration. Not only do, does your development team need to come in and, and write some of this PHP code in the background, they're actually going to talk to you as you're writing your tests, you filled out every single field. Is that actually the right thing? Are you testing certain values and that's what the important thing is? Or are you actually trying to test that you can submit a form and you don't care what the values are? It's all about collaboration. One really cool thing um, with BHAT is there, because there's such a great community in Drupal around it, is this feature context.php you can actually download a bunch of them where they've got common Drupal things, like if I log in, if I search, and all of that is ready to go. You just need to, uh, when you look at that file, 
it's it's written the the function name is kind of in English, so you and it shows you in the comments, which unfortunately I had to snip out of here, of actually how to write that step that says, "Given I am on, then I should see." It gives you all that information. So the next thing is, let's run some tests, right? Here's a snippet of my terminal. Um, I choose to run these from my terminal, and you can actually ha have it all run um, as a headless browser, so you don't see anything that happens. Or you can have it um, run through Selenium, and that will actually pop up a browser, and you can watch it click through everything. It moves really, really, really fast. So uh, you, it's hard to do that way, but you can put in steps that say, and I wait, and I wait, so it slows it down so your eyes can catch up and follow. But you can actually watch every single test happen and it basically be clicked on. So in this example, I'm running tags equal test. I didn't want to run my entire suite, just wanted to run my, my test ones. It displays right there in my terminal the name of the feature and you know, in order to find uh, events as a website user, I want to be able to see them displayed. And then we see the tags, this is the at Drupal Nights, the at events, and also the at test. Tells me my scenario, tells me what file that scenario is on and what line it's on. And the next thing um, it does is actually runs it, given I am on the front page. Then I should uh, see, get notified about upcoming events block in sidebar A. And at the very, very end, it gives you the, the statistics, the synopsis, and it says, we ran one scenario, that one scenario passed, and in the, everything that we ran, there was actually two steps and those two steps passed. And it color codes it, it makes it green for you. Uh, here's another one that I, I tried running, and, and it says, uh, when I fill out each field of contact site form with random text. Does that sound familiar? I just showed you the back end code for that. So this time I'm running through um, and running it, the contact form a different way. Uh, I'm gonna fill, and then I fill out the subject field with nothing. So I overwrite what I had just filled out randomly so that I had one that was nothing. And then I dance a jig, I should get an error message. Okay, let's look at my, my statistics here. Uh, I ran a couple other things with this, so there was a total of three scenarios, two of them passed. One of them was undefined. I had no idea what to do with it. So that breaks out to 15 steps, 13 passing, one was skipped completely, never even touched, and one was undefined. <clears throat> so this was my test, and when it got, everything's passing, it's all green, until it gets to, I dance a jig. And there's no back-end code that tells it how to do that. It has no idea what to do, so it goes, yeah, that's undefined, and because of that, I can't complete this entire test unit, so I'm going to skip the following one. So. That's a little scary, like great, now it's undefined, what do I do? Well, it is so nice that after it goes through it, it actually prints the code right there. And says you can implement this step definition and it gives you the snippet of code for you to paste in your uh, uh, feature context.php file. Now what it does say is it's, it's an empty snippet. It does have the great documentation at the top that says given I dance a jig, that's that format that I said that you guys all need to follow. Um, it names the, the public function very similarly but it says uh, throw new pending exception. So that means now it doesn't know how to test it yet and it's going to throw an error, but it'll keep going as if it passed so that your skipped one will actually get tested. And all you need to do is paste that into your file. And as you're working with your developers too, um, either you or them could paste it in, but that's a red flag. Like I gotta go back and, and fig figure out how do I test dancing a jig. One of the important things when you're starting this, especially when you've got a site that's, you know, started 10 years ago, is like, oh my God, where do I begin? <laughs> How do I test everything? Uh, so my recommendation is, what has the most business value for you? One of my obvious examples is uploading photos. Uh, every now and then, when a safety officer is submitting an inspection, they want to take a photo of broken equipment. It happens every now and then. If you run a Flickr site and someone can't upload a photo, and that's, that's devastating. So your business value is testing that. Whereas my company, we're gonna put that on the back burner. It's not that big of a deal. It's not gonna make us um, everything you know, blow up for us. So what feature, if taken away, would essentially render your site useless? Different examples. Registering, logging in, customizing profiles. Our site, no big deal. You're running something like a Facebook, yeah, User profiles are very, very important, so making sure you start your test coverage with that. 
Another way to go about it is you've been tasked with some new feature development. So every time you've got new development, you're writing tests for that immediately. Um, and very, very slowly, so you've got that. They're like, what's the related thing that I can tack on to this that's got high business value? I'm already in the section. I'm very, very familiar with it. So writing a couple more tests for the business value ones, you can add those on. Users are the most important part of a website. If you don't have users, why would you need a website? You need to put them first. You need to understand them and their needs. That's why we're creating personas to trying to figure out who these users are. We're outlining their journeys and defining the user stories. And these are things that as project and product managers, you're doing anyways. Let's take that next step and move to behavior-driven development. The other thing that's wonderful is that agile practices, like I mentioned, and BDD, it encourages communication between those two departments. A lot of times, you know, the product team, the developers, they work in silos and communication is very, very challenging. You're forcing them to work together. If the project manager is writing the human readable code and the developer comes in to write the back end test for that, and then all of a sudden there's conversation going on, is that really what I want to do? Do I want to fill out every field on the contact form or is there another way? Is there a better way? And there's a bonus. If you migrate your site to another version of Drupal and you haven't done a whole re-architecture and redesign, um, or maybe you switch it to another platform, all of your scenarios will still work. The backend code will need a little bit of work, but the, the user stories and then the uh, scenarios that you had written should all be the same. So to recap, this all started because I couldn't sleep. Um, technical deck was keeping me up at night. We kept making new bugs. and we trying our darndest to QA everything, and it's just taking forever. We were not being efficient, so we needed to find a better way. And this was our better way. We uh, started defining personas. You know, a site maybe has 10 personas. Jot those down like on a napkin. Take one of them and really uh, flush it out. Figure out who that person is. And for us, that's Roger. We feel very, very close to Roger. We're actually very fortunate. So we have all these client sites, but we also have Earth Institute, which is our, our demo site. And it is a fully functioning, filled out version of BioRaft. And Roger is the EHS officer in that. So from the day that I started at, at BioRaft, I was introduced to Roger, but he didn't have a face. All he had was you know, like a job description, and that's it. So it's about taking that one step further figuring out what their most common tasks are, highlighting which journeys have the highest big, uh, business value, and then breaking those into steps, your user stories, and writing your test cases first, then developing. And then it's acceptance testing. You, if you approve those test cases as the, the product manager, they go develop, and it passes, well then, they did their job right. It matched the spec that you are already approved of, approved. So taking the deliverables from these best practices that everyone preaches um, in project management and usabilities, um, it's amazing fodder to start uh, a behavioral testing initiative in your organization. So I've got this great little picture here. I love pictures. Um, it's not a full circle, but everything that you, you start with the user uh, personas, work to journeys, break it down into stories, and bam, you've got behavioral testing, and then you sleep at night. So I did a lot of research, um, so I've got a lot of links. I recommend that you download my slides to click on these links. I will be posting these to DrupalNights.org. As I had mentioned earlier, uh, we once a month via Google Hangouts, we do uh, presentations down in Cambridge. They all go on this website, slides and video. And anytime anyone on my team presents at a camp or con, it's another place for us to upload slides. So that's where I'll be going to post these later today or tomorrow but it'll be on DrupalKnights.org. Any questions? Yes, there's a microphone right here. <laughs> Unless you want to shout. I can be loud. Um, how did you come up with, what process did you use to come up with the personas? Did you based on data? And then how did you come up with your groups? Sure. Um, group, what do you mean by groups? Okay. 
Um, so it, you start the process by thinking, in my head, is like, well, who's the most important user on my site? What type of person is that? Your power user of sorts. Um, and there might be you know, a handful, so you don't need to grade them. But take someone like that who is in your site very, very frequently. And like I said, start sketching out a napkin. Have a brainstorm, step, brainstorm session you know, where there's no wrong answer and write down every single one of those in a very high level form and then discuss, okay, which one has the highest business value? And then take that one and do the deep dive. And then go back to your entire list. Um, we have a couple of our personas completely flushed out, but the rest are still sitting on a napkin because we're, it's business value. Who, who do we want to spend our resources on? And so it depends on your site by categories. I mean, for us, it's very, very easy. Um, we have actually a role in the site that's environmental health and safety. We have a lab member. We have a principal investigator. So those are very easy for us to pull from. Your site, it may be obvious, or you might have to think. It might be everybody in your site is actually the same role, but you're really thinking about personality traits and other characteristics. Um, like the person that is scared of technology versus the person that is trying to hack your system. And you can take those different uh, paths as well. Yes? Okay, um, so you can, like I was just filling out that form with your name. Well, you can have a scenario that says, you know, if I fill, fill out the form with 47 characters, I should see an error message that says only 40 characters is allowed. So it really depends on your, what's best for your organization. A lot of organizations filling out the form with random text and hit and go and just making sure it submits is all they need. In other cases, Data validity is actually the important thing. So um, your, in your human read readable step, you say, if I fill out the form with you know, whatever X number of characters, um, and then I should see whatever that error message is. So you can do that for each one. Yes? In my company, it's the developers who are driving ABD. Mm -hmm. uh, we're having a really hard time selling our project managers on the idea of writing these tests up front, the argument that we're getting back is, well, I'm writing <laughs> specs for you. How <coughs> So the question is, is how do you get project managers to want to write tests and participate rather than just the developers, where um, I'm coming from the perspective, I'm like, yay, I need to get my developers to do it now. Uh, I think the easiest way is they've already done 90% of the work if they've got their user stories. They're 90% of the way there. Um, you, I mean, the one thing about Agile is that you know, you're iterative and you change your processes and you, there is no flavor of Agile that is the right one. It's what works for your organization. So maybe instead of writing strict user stories, just have them write the tests. They're very similar. I mean, we saw that pattern. You know, okay, so we, change, we, we flip the bottom two lines, essentially. That's how I would do it. And they're 90% there. The other great thing, too, is... Um, if after they're coming back and doing the spec check after development, it's very clear if the developer has done a job or not. And all they need to do is, basically it ensures if the tests are written well, the developers will follow the spec every time, which is really nice. Nothing is worse than like doing the final confirmed you know, phase of testing and going, well, this works wonderfully, but you didn't follow the instructions. Well, the test is going to tell you that. Yes? So I recommend starting with new features uh, that you are developing for your site first and start that process with them. So all of a sudden you're adding a blog feature to a, we a website that, no long that didn't have that before. Write your tests, build it, run the tests. But then the question is, well, what about this article feature that I already got? When do I fit that in? One way is blogs and articles maybe behave a little similarly. Um, so that you can borrow some of those tests and, like I said, start with the new features and then slowly build out the, one, the other parts of your, existing parts of your site that have the highest business value. What if the things that, if they were broken on production, would really make people cry? Yes? Uh, what, what tools are you using to crack code 
At the moment, we are not using any tools. Um, that's an excellent thing to try to figure out, because like, we're not looking at lines of code. You can count functions on a site and say, I've got 50 functions and I've got 49 tests. I'm doing really good. But this is, this is the user's experience. Uh, to, for Roger's uh, example, in order for him to schedule an inspection, I showed you, you know, the high level and then two possible you know, paths you could take just to do that. I bet I could find 50. Okay, maybe not 50. So there's no way to track that unless you're making a list of like, these are the ones I need to accomplish now. There's no way to know. It's the user's experience. It's quite variable. Yes? Sure, I, I have extremely limited experience as, in order to compare, but the one thing I'll say is that all these tests that we were writing, you've got two ways to run them. You can run the BHAT test with the headless browser, that's just running in the command line, or you can say, hey, use Selenium and fire up Firefox for me. And that's what Selenium looks like, is it's firing up Firefox. Um, another thing that I have seen, um, it was a presentation I went to at, I believe it was Boston PHP, and they were talking about Selenium. And I felt like that they were writing code extremely repetitively. It could have been the style of the developer or the limitation of Selenium. The one great thing about BHAT, which I, I was not sharing much code here, was that you can actually put a, a table, like a matrix of data, and say, can you loop through this? This is my uh, variables for X, my variables for Y, and it will run through the whole thing. So if you've got cases where you've got a field and it's got eight you know, restrictions on it. It needs to be 40 characters. It needs an exclamation point. It needs this. It needs that. You can have your test cases run through and try this. This should be my error. Try this one. I should get this error. And all in one test. So you're not writing that function every time. That matrix is within BHAT or Selenium? It's in BHAT. So that I, I find that to be a, a benefit, too. Yes? Talking about developer overhead to write the, the PHP backend code for it? Yeah, yeah, just trying to get a sense of how much that would actually add to the project. At the moment, I'm the one writing it, um, and it takes a very long time for me. So I, I cannot begin to guesstimate a, a seasoned PHP pro how, how that would work. The benefit is, is the organization is already done for them because when you write your tests, if there is not a backend code, you get that pop-up function that says, this is what you need to do next, and you can prioritize that. Sure. What I like is the, the consistency. Uh, you can preload your system with certain variables and saying, I, I, before you run this test, take care of this, this business work. We need to make sure that this user is created, it's a fresh user, um, rather than using some real person on your test site. So you can take care of all of those so you know what your outcomes are going to be because you've preloaded the system, and then it can clean up after itself as well. Um, I hate it when people ask, well, does testing take more time? Well, of course it does. But do you have a better product because of that? Yes, you do. Sort of the same thing, but if you have any sense, let's say you have a thousand hour project, how much time do you have to allocate to that? I, I, the question is, how much time do you allocate? What percentage of your, your pro, uh, project to testing? And I don't know the answer. This is something right now that uh, an initiative that I started at my company, and it's a slow process where I'm I'm still learning out the best way so that I can get everyone on board. They all think it's wonderful. I'm very supportive, but we haven't actually gotten to the st point where we're we're implementing everything for every for every feature. Yep. Sure. Our, our sprints are the entire thing is roughly four weeks. Um, basically, on a Wednesday, we release code, and, and then Thursday is like retrospectives and kickoff and everything like that. Um, we do a feature freeze three weeks in and then release uh, four weeks. So our, we try to test things on each tickets going forward, but that last week is essentially a, a testing sprint. Not only are we testing the tickets, but then we're doing that 
that major, like my big testing ticket, we're going through and trying to click everything in the blog and everything. And our developers all participate in that. We even pull in some people from the the account management team, you know, to come in and help us with that because it's so big and, and so important. The things that we find by just unvariably um, hitting up bugs in the system. So are you at the point where, where you're kind of writing out your tickets and you just bypass the user story and go right to the B hat code? Um, We're not at that point yet. We're yeah. still doing the um, the user stories with the, so the mock-ups. So you have an intermediate step in there. Where you go from user story to B hat. User story with mock-ups okay. to, to B hat testing. Uh, can I take you back to the news question? Absolutely. So we do things a little bit differently as far as estimating goes. Um, we're not necessarily, we're not billable per hour based on our institution. A lot of times what we're developing is a collaborative approach. So when we estimate tickets, it's actual true development time. It does not include any, any testing or bounce back and things like that. So our organization's a little bit different. But you ask, well, how do you factor that into the whole process? It's not about the sprint. It's about the ticket. Each ticket has a test involved with it. So if I have um, a ticket to change, uh, let's see, you've got a username printed like a welcome username at the top of the site, and the, the, the ticket is to change that to welcome first name, last name. Well, before you start writing you know, that, that theme override, you go in and you say, um, you find all of the existing tests, or if there aren't any, make your test right then and there, then you write your code and then test it. So it's, it's part of the development process and the development hour. So I guess I agree, yes. Yeah, you can't close the individual ticket until the test is, is you know, it was written, you developed, you ran the test, the test was successful, then you can close your ticket out. The challenging thing, though, is like, that's, that's for the per ticket, that's new development, is when you're trying to, to go through your backlog of, of these are the features already on my site and tackling those, like when do, you, when do those get tested? And you just weave those in. Yes? So with BHAT, there's a, a YAML file, which is just a text file that has a couple variables in it, and it asks you what's the URL you would like to test. So you put, you know, development.bioraft.com, and that's what it goes and tests. So you can, I mean, one of the, the last demonstration I saw, they went to Wikipedia, and that, they tested Wikipedia. So you can test anything that you can access, you know, via the web or via your local machine. Sounds like you're not maybe using Google extension. What I've so I have gone through uh, one of the the Drupal B hat modules and grabbed uh, the back end code and was lo looping through that and I added that in. Time for about one last question. Uh, so. When I ran that via the command line, there were the statistics at the bottom, and it said, we ran two tests. In those two tests, one passed, one failed. And of what we ran in those two tests, there was actually you know, 13 steps. And these are the ones that passed, these are the ones that failed. So they can see, basically, you've got greater code coverage every single release, and these are the number ones passing. And Depending on what fails, I mean, that's kind of up to you. If it fails, is that, is that a release blocker? It depends what that test is. You may say, you know, no, we'll get that in, you know, next week during patch, you know, as we're fixing things or, or not. But in an ideal world, um, yeah, it's, it's a month sprint. 
So you've got time to run this over and over again. You can run the ones just for what the area you're working in, but then you can periodically actually run your entire suite of tests and check your entire application. Because if you're only running the ones for the section you're working in, you're not going to notice that thing that keeps me up at night is where I change something here and that breaks. So you do need to constantly run your entire suite. Awesome, guys. Thank you very much. And stickers.